This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Damore, author of two New York Times best-selling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 70, Do I Tell My Daughter She's Beautiful? You know, you you really have the best skin. <laughs> I'm noticing this as we're taping. Like, it doesn't matter what time of day, whether you have makeup or not. I, I, you have such great skin. And I just feel like I'm moisturizing and moisturizing and moisturizing in this cold winter weather and can never get it right. Well, Rena, I mean... Number one, I'm vain. Number two, better living through chemistry. Okay, so I started using um, topical retin-A's oh. when, about 17 years ago. Wow. Um, and, you know, I started on the, you know, the low grades, like lower dose stuff that you can get at the pharmacy. And then I've sort of bumped it up over time. And, you know, I can rationalize this as having grown up in Colorado where there's a lot of, um, you know, we got a lot of sun damage because we didn't wear sunscreen back then. And retin-A's work to reverse sun damage. Oh. Um, but honestly, real, really, Rena, it's vanity. And, and <laughs> they work. I mean, they work. They, they are, you know, kind of boring, kind of old. They've been around forever. Um, they're hard to get started with. They can be pretty tough on your skin, but they work. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it just reminds me that the divide between men and women who, you know, things that we obsess over that I, I know men take care of their skin. There's some men out there. But speaking on the topic of beauty, we got this incredible letter from a dad that just made us say, wow, I'm going to read this to you. Dear Lisa and Rena, I'm a father of four with three boys and a 14-year-old daughter. I'm doing my best to parent a girl in this social media, selfie-based, ridiculous world. I just finished Lisa's book, Under Pressure. And towards the end of the book, you talk about girls obsessing about their flaws and comparing themselves to what they see on Instagram. The sentence that stood out to me was, quote, we don't want our girls to feel bad about their looks, yet we should aim to balance the enthusiasm we express about their appearance with our enthusiasm about the rest of what they have to offer the world. If I tell my daughter she looks beautiful, I feel like I'm feeding into the focus of appearance. If I don't tell my daughter she's beautiful, I feel like I'm not building up her self-confidence. Please help. Isn't this such a great letter? It's such a great letter. And honestly, it's so accurate to the tension of having a girl. Hmm. I, and I really struggle with this. And I was struggling with this while I was writing Under Pressure because part of me feels like I don't want for one more drop of ink to be spilled or one more word to be said about girls' appearance. Like, I am so over it. Talking about girls' appearance, the world is obsessed with girls' appearance. Every time, You know, I just, like, I'm so over it. And then... One of my daughters will walk in the kitchen. I'll be like, oh, my gosh, you look adorable. <laughs> <laughs> do you do yes. this too? Oh, you absolutely. Can't, can't even help it. That is like a, a laughter that I totally identify with exactly what you're saying. But, you know, I, what I love about this dad's letter is like, what do you do as a parent? Not saying they look beautiful or, or good also has an impact on their self-esteem, right? It does. And, and it's so... It's so complicated, Rena. Like, I mean, this is one of those things where I kind of like turn and twist and turn and twist within it because on the one hand, you kind of can't help yourself or I can't help myself from, you know, being like, oh, you look so cute. Or, you're, so, you're so darling. And and it and it feels um, unstoppable <laughs> in a way, like or I don't want to stop it. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, especially those of us raising daughters, like the last thing we want to reinforce is the idea that their outward appearance is where their value lies. But and I'm so, so torn yeah. by this. Like, I, should you not ever comment then on their appearance? How do you deal with that? I, I just, I have to say, like, of course, you, you have to comment sometimes on how adorable they are and how beautiful you think they are, right? I think that that, I, I have no problem with that. Where I think this can go off the rails, I think there's a few ways. One is if that becomes a heavy emphasis, right? If there's a lot of time and energy spent talking and thinking about a daughter's appearance. And that's, you know, the letter, the line he quoted in the letter from Under Pressure is like, yeah, we're going to end up talking about our kids' appearance, especially probably our daughter's appearance, but we got to balance it with talking mm -hmm. about everything else. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, finding a balance where maybe for every 
one comment you're making on how cute you think your kid is, yeah. you're making nine on her science project. Right? <laughs> <I think laughs> Got that's it. one way to do it. The thing that I um, think about a lot is um, ways that people have tried to earnestly address um, helping girls feel good about themselves and good about their bodies. And and one place where I've kind of come to this, pl- like, hmm, you know, place is around saying to girls, everybody's beautiful. All mm-hmm. bodies are beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, that may be something that is true. That may be something adults believe. Like, I'm kind of, you know, agnostic on that. What I'm interested in is how that lands for girls. And and I think there are, I think it's tricky because I think some girls are like, uh, no, they're not. And I operate in a world where it's apparent to me that we have beauty standards and that I do or don't fit those. Like, you know, teenagers don't really go for stuff that doesn't line up with their own observations, right? And so when adults are saying, like, everybody's beautiful, you know, any teenage girl with her salt will be like, yeah, except for there's five girls in my class who get all the attention, and then there's the rest of us, you right. know? So that, if it doesn't work for the teenagers for me, I'm like, well, then it probably doesn't work. The other problem I have with this, Rena, and I want to see, what, like, tell me what you think about this. When we're saying everybody's beautiful, everybody's beautiful, they're all beautiful in their own way, we're back to talking about appearance, and we're back to talking about it like it's important, right? Like, I'm going to go out of my way to tell you that everyone's beautiful, which for me, like, now we're just talking about girls' outsides again, and I I don't want to talk about girls' outsides again. So for me, this is where it gets really complex. What do you think? So I'll tell you something that I did with my son. I I Uh cannot. He hates wearing pants. And (laughs) it was 18 degrees, like all week long. Mm -hmm. And finally, for the first time in years, he decides to put on sweats, you Mm -hmm. know, And he came home, actually he wore jeans, which he hates wearing jeans, absolutely hates wearing jeans. And he came home and it just came out of my mouth. I said, oh, you look so handsome with those jeans on, just so handsome. And I could see like he didn't want to show it, but his face perked up as any kid does when you give them a compliment about their appearance, right? Yeah. But I think that's sort of the reality. And I realized I said that to him because I want him to feel good in wearing those pants and that he, you know looks good and have confidence as he's wearing them. And I feel the same is true with looks for girls. Like you want them in those critical, as you've always said, puberty for girls is where their self-confidence plummets. Yep. Yep. And and it's interesting because you can take pleasure in your appearance, right? And And it's fun to take pleasure in your appearance. And that doesn't mean that you're being some superficial person who only thinks about their appearance, right? And I think that that's the, um, the kind of sticky spot this can get into. And, and you know, I think about, you know, teenage girls who work out a really funky and unique style and have a lot of fun with it, where they are wearing stuff that is very much their own look and they're doing their hair and makeup in really cool ways that are very much their own. I'm like, rock on, kid, right? I mean, you're having a lot of fun with your appearance in a way that feels healthy and individual. So it's such a, I love this letter because it gets right to the heart of this thing of like, on the one hand, we just don't want to focus on girls' appearance. On the other hand, there's some action there that's not all bad (laughs) and we don't want to miss out on it. I also think when parents say, you look so adorable. I think most kids are like, thank you. And you're my mom. (laughs) (laughs) True, true. You know, and so then for better or for worse, our words don't actually go that far in their own assessment of their appearance, because they know we are going to be biased on their behalf. So I don't, um, I think our words for better or for worse, don't have nearly as much weight in this department as we might imagine they do. Interesting. Lisa, I want to ask you sort of what are tangible things we as parents can do to focus less on appearance? We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Rena and I have some fun news for users of Facebook. You can now subscribe and listen to the Ask Lisa podcast right on the Ask Lisa page of Facebook. 
Go there, click on podcast either on the mobile app or your desktop, and it will download for you every week, and you can join in a conversation with us and other listeners about each week's episode. Welcome back to the Ask Lisa podcast. We're talking about beauty and appearance and kids. Lisa, I want to ask you, how? what can we as parents do to put less emphasis on appearance in a world that, as this dad said in this letter, it's all about selfies and beauty and social media is just all about appearance? Well, that's exactly right. So I think let's start with social media. Let's start with the kind of time the kids are spending on it and the ways they spend time on it. And that's a problem because, like you say, you know, social media, especially these highly visual platforms, you know, like Instagram, um, they are entirely about one's outward looks, um, one's container, as I've sometimes called it, called it as opposed to one's content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so kids spend a lot of time looking on those. And I think there are ways parents should get in on this. I think if you can try to limit it, and limit it by keeping your kids busy with a whole bunch of much more, you know, kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um, nutritious activities, you know, developmentally nutritious activities. But then go ahead and make comments, right? If you see a very posed, very um, curated, crafted image of a classmate, I think the parent should say, is that what she really looks like? How much time do you think she spent making that? Really? Oh, yeah, so absolutely. You just call them out? So if you see your child talking or looking or saying something about someone's appearance, you just call them out and say, do you really think they look – do they really look that, that way in school? I would, actually, because, you know, there's so much energy goes into making these images and, the, like, the right angle and the right, you know, kind of hip – thrust you know, to sort of bring her about a certain kind of like slim appearance. I mean, it's it's a lot of energy goes into it. So I think for the parent to push a little bit and say, okay, but like really, like how much time do you think it took to get to that image that, yes, in this 2D square looks so, you know, kind of quintessentially magazine gorgeous, like that's a lot of work. Like what do you think was involved? Your kid will look at you and be like, oh, oh my gosh, like what are you doing? You're so annoying. <laughs> do it anyway. Like do wow. it anyway, 100%. Gosh. That's what I'm doing wrong with Instagram, the hip thrust, the right way. <laughs> Where's your hip thrust, Rena? Like, you got to <laughs> work on that. Um, the other way to do it around social media is to say, you know, one of the metaphors I bring up in Under Pressure is, you know, social media, especially these highly visual worlds, they're like the, um, the, the showroom floor of a furniture store, whereas we actually are living in lived in homes, you know, how we oh, look, yeah. how we operate, like that's a lived in home. Oh, that's good. Right. And a lived in home is never going to look anywhere near as nice as a showroom floor because people actually live there. <laughs> wow. That's good. Yeah. And so I would consider introducing that metaphor to your kid. And then when your kid is flipping through Insta, TikTok, whatever, being like, yep, that is their showroom floor. You know, that is their furniture store. Um, that cannot be the lived-in version of that child. You know, that cannot be what that person really looks like in real life. So always pushing a, on this idea that this is appearance-oriented and the appearance is very, in many ways, deceiving, right? It, it's very crafted. It's very much designed to be unusually attractive and pushing back. The third thing you can do if you're going to bug your kid, like go all the way, the third thing you can do is to say, tell me more about her. Um, you know, what's she like? Is she fun? Is she funny? Is she, you know, serious about school? Like, really, um, be like, yeah, I can see she's cute. Like, I can see she's worked very hard to put up a very cute photo. But like, I don't care about that. Like, tell me more about that kid. And use that as a displaced way to, um, you know, push on this idea of like appearance, appearance, you know, like, we've all known people like, right, we never, you've known people who were objectively gorgeous, but you get to know them and you're like, oh, God, they're the worst, you know? And, yeah, yeah. and I think kind of pushing that out into the conversation with your kid. So you're saying have a conversation like, okay, she's pretty, she's beautiful, but what's she really like? Like, what does she bring mm -hmm. to the table? Mm -hmm. And then that really works in getting the kid to see like, that's not all. Like, how, how does that help? 
I think it does just because you're just reminding them. Like, yeah, she might be, you know, super cute, but mm-hmm. do you, do people like her? Do they want to hang out with her? Does she make people's lives better? I think that that can be a great question to ask. Again, even if your kid's like, oh, my gosh, go away. You're so annoying. I think it's still a way to make the point. And I think what's really hard is, especially in the younger ages, there can be um, an extraordinary extraordinary amount of power that comes with being an unusually attractive child. And that, I will say, among teenagers does, I think, tend to diminish as they age. Um, You know, so seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, maybe early 10th, very good looking kids can have a lot of power out of that. As kids get to be 14, 15, 16, they become more sophisticated in their assessment of one another and will start to really... um, find the attraction in kids who may not have sort of, you know, won the good looking lottery at birth. And and it's actually one of my favorite things to watch happen in adolescence as kids who really weren't dating because maybe they weren't, you know, fitting that very narrow band of, you know, what our culture says is attractive, start dating later in high school as um, as their peers discover how attractive they are. So it, it goes away with time, and, and it's fun to see. But I, I do think it's a bit of an uphill to convince a seventh grader sometimes that um, looks, you know, they're not all that. Mm-hmm. Because in seventh grade, they can be. Hmm. So what can parents do to build confidence in girls? The key, I think, is to focus on what they control. And they control things like how they treat other people, the activities they do, how much practice they put into things, school, um, especially if school something, you know, that's a source of pleasure or fits well with that girl's skill set. Um, and, and to repeatedly frame it in terms of, you know, people's appearance, it's kind of, they kind of got handed that. And they don't really have much say about it. And also, you can't change it that much. I think part of what's really hard is our kids live in a digital world that suggests that the body is kind of infinitely mutable. Like you can lose weight, you can trim your thighs, you can, you know, have makeup that makes you look like a totally different person. And and I think that that can play to this idea that their outward appearance is something they have a lot of control over and could change if they wanted to. So one of the ways to help kids build confidence is just to say, yeah, you know, I mean, the way we look, it's kind of the hand we're dealt, but it's a very small part of that hand. Like who we are is is really where the action is. And that may not feel true right now, but I promise you it'll feel true before long. Hmm. The hand we're dealt, that's just so good that I never thought about having this conversation and getting them to look beyond just the, I think we get so stuck because it's such a superficial world about appearances that you're saying just by having these conversations with them and subtly, you know, talking about other kids and what else they bring to the table can really make a difference in how they evaluate their own selves. It can. Now, there's something that's not coming up that I think is really interesting. And I hear this a lot from parents, which is when your kid doesn't look as good as you think they could. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Right, like this happens, you know, and I watch especially with adolescent girls as they're trying to figure out their um, clothing and what clothes suit their bodies. You know how as as we've aged, Rena, you know, you like, you know what's going to look good on you and you're going to, you know, you're not going to try it. And and there's something really interesting that happens where it it seems like so completely um, perennial. There is a fashion And it is what everybody wears, especially adolescents. And it works on some people, and it does not actually work all that well on everyone. And and I think that one of the challenges as a parent is if you're watching your daughter who, you know, is as beautiful as can be because she's your kid, and she's putting herself together in a way that you're like, oh, that doesn't actually flatter you all that much, you know, that that may be the fashion, but that's not really the look. So then the question is, should the parents say something at that point? Mm -hmm. And my general view is no. (laughs) (laughs) This is a great tongue biting moment for parents. Mm -hmm. 
Um, because I don't think you're going to get your teenager to take your fashion advice. You know, teenagers are not usually all that interested in the um, fashion input of their 50-year-old mothers. I do think you'll hurt feelings. And, and I think it's a short-lived thing. Kids figure it out eventually. But that, for me, I think is, is the, the flip of this. When, when you're looking at your kid, and you're like, oh, you know what would be so much better on her would be X. Right. And, and right. having to just wait and say nothing. The trickiest version of this, and I think there is something to be said, is when she's wearing something that's actually not appropriate at right. all. Right. Right. <laughs> like those crop tops. I mean, at what point will we get the rest of the shirt back? Well, you know? it is. I know. I like, know. I only it's... get half a shirt with these crop tops. I'm done with them. Well, and of course, the parent joke that you always make if your kid shows up and then is like, oh, did you pay half price for that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So that is a place where I think you can comment on not entirely approving of what your yeah. kid is wearing. But again, this has to be done very, very carefully. Um, and and the first thing I want to say about this, and since we're focusing on girls, I think this is really true. One thing I've seen repeatedly is... Um, the shirt and the skirt that fit her last summer yes, um, look really different on her this summer. Oh, wow. That, you know, that's going to happen. That. That's going to happen in your family. Oh. Um, so your what daughter, do you say? Yeah. Do you, <laughs> well, it's say? interesting. Right? It's really interesting because the kid doesn't usually perceive it. Oh. Um, you know, they grab this, like, grab the favorite T-shirt, grab the favorite, you know, like, little skirt out from last summer, throw it on. You walk in the kitchen, you're like, whoa. <laughs> like, that oh, is... Yeah. That is a really different look than last summer when you were 12. Um, and that is tricky. Ooh. So, again, right, you have, to, you have to make a judgment about how it's going to feel um, for her. And you have to make this judgment when you are having a very strong personal reaction yourself. Um, and so you might take a beat. <laughs> you might say, oh, it looks like you've outgrown that. <laughs> and does that work by saying? And they're like, no, mom, it's, that's the style. It's fine. It looks good. Yeah. Um, some of these you're going to lose. Some of these you're going to lose. Right. Okay. Right. But there may be a moment where you walk in the kitchen and your daughter's wearing what I've heard to refer to as um, ovarian length <laughs> skirts. That's what she calls it, ovarian length. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard somebody That's call great. it that, ovarian length skirt. And yeah. you're like, no, 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 man. You are not leaving the house like that. <laughs> okay. So to do that without offending your daughter to no end, I think it is worth saying something like, look. You are rocking that look. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. And here's the deal. I am not ready for you to wear that out of the house. You may be ready. I am not ready. You are still my little girl. I know that it is weird for me to say this, but people are going to look at you. Grown men are going to look at you in ways that I am not ready for. So I need you to do me a favor and go change. I will get there eventually. I am not there today. Wow. Okay. So that's a way to... Um, weigh in on the ovarian length skirt that is not <laughs> saying, oh, my God, you look like a tramp. What the heck are right. you doing? Right. Which is very easy to do, but not the right thing because the kid's like, what? They yeah. just don't see it that way. Totally. Totally right. So, Lisa, I know we've run through a whole bunch of things here, but when you step back for a moment, and God, I love this letter so much from this dad, what are the three things we sort of need to keep in mind as we're talking about beauty and appearance and kids? I do think it's okay every once in a while to say, like, oh, my gosh, you look adorable or, oh, you look so handsome. I have no problem with that. And I do think we are insulated by the reality that our kids basically take it with a grain of salt anyway. That's one. Two, I really would have parents be very um, aware of the ratio of comments on appearance to comments on everything else. And then three, right, Rena, I will always come back to this rule. Don't talk about it. Be about it. So a lot of how kids will come to understand how much appearance matters is by watching their parents and how much emphasis their parents place on their own appearance. Mm -hmm. So I would want our kids to see us enjoying taking care of ourselves, enjoying putting ourselves together in ways that feel fun, right? I mean, it's fun to put an outfit together. It's fun to like your haircut, to have them witness our the pleasure we take in it for ourselves as opposed to watching us do it with a very, very, very close eye on how this is being received by others and whether or not other people like how I look. Hmm. So those are the things I would focus on. That's great. So Lisa, what do you have for us for Parenting to Go? 
So for parenting to go, you know, if you do walk in the kitchen and you do see your daughter in an ovarian length skirt and you do say, oh, my gosh, like, what are you wearing? Which could totally happen. You can fix it. You can fix it. And so I would encourage a parent who's done this, and believe me, this is something that happens a lot, to say, I'm really sorry. That was unfair. It caught me off guard. That must have felt rotten for you. I apologize. Here's what I meant to say if I could have a do-over. And then, you know, come up with something that's a little bit kinder and more neutral as a, as a second pass. The do-over. That's something Lisa Damore has taught me that I didn't know was part of parenting vocabulary. Absolutely. And next week, we're going to talk about what do you do when your kid is dumped by their friends? Oof, man, Rena, this is a tough one, and I'm hearing it a lot. Wow, that's interesting. I'll see you next week, Lisa. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to asklisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.